It's gratifying tonight to have so many of you present and have so many congregations represented and especially to have so many preachers. Time would fail me if I paused to make some comment on each congregation represented and each preacher present. But I appreciate the presence of each one of you. And I appreciate the privilege of coming back to this area and renewing old friendships and making new ones. Perhaps most of you know that I have a standing invitation from the Forest Park congregation to come back on the first Sunday in August every year as long as I'm able to come. And that means about 25 or 30 more years, as I understand it. On October the 18th, I will have been preaching 60 years. That's a long time, isn't it? When I began preaching, I thought if I lived to preach 50 years, it would be wonderful, and it has been wonderful, but I've reached 60 and still looking to the future. But on October the 15th, this third Sunday in October, I'm preaching at Hillsburg Congregation. That's the church where I've been attending services since 1939. I preached there for about 12 years. I've been an elder there ever since. But on that Sunday, I'm preaching as a kind of 60th anniversary occasion. And we're expecting visitors from many of the places where I've held meetings, and especially the places where I have done regular work. And I hope that many of you can be present on October the 15th next in Nashville, Tennessee at the Hillsborough Church. Now tonight I'm preaching on the general theme of the three crosses. There were three crosses on Mount Calvary on the day of the crucifixion. And those three crosses stand in relation to death in three different uh, phases. You know, sin and death have been related all through the ages. God Almighty told Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden that in the day they sinned, they would die. The word death, of course, means separation, and people die in two senses. They die physically in the sense that the spirit and body are separated, and they die spiritually in the sense that the spirit is separated from God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they became separated from God, spiritually speaking. They didn't die physically that day, but spiritually they became separated from God by sin, and consequently could be spoken of as being dead in sin. And sin and death have been related in some sense down through all the ages. And the eternal day again, sin and death will be related. You will recall that in the 20th chapter of the Revelation it said that if any man's name was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death, even the lake of fire. The everlasting punishment of the wicked is spoken of as being the second death. We're not surprised, therefore, to find that on the day of the cross, the day of the crucifixion, that there were three crosses standing on Calvary and that they represented sin and death in three different respects, three different relationships. We find, for example, that there was the impenitent robber on the one hand and the penitent robber on the other of our Lord Jesus Christ. The impenitent robber died in sin. The most awful thing that can happen to a human being is to die in sin. There isn't anything else comparable to dying in sin. Our Lord said in the 8th chapter of John that you should die in your sin. And where I go, you can't come. That's a clear-cut statement that people who die in sin cannot go to heaven. We have a good illustration of that in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man died in sin, and he was given to understand that no change could be made in his condition, that there was a great gulf fixed between him and Lazarus, a great gulf fixed between the saved and the lost. 
that no change could be made. And here in the day of the cross, we find this man, the impenitent robber, dying in sin. And it's rather difficult to understand, in a way, how that man, experiencing the things of Calvary, being in the presence of the Lord, and hearing his words, yet would be impenitent. A man dying and knowing that he was in the act of dying and yet a man who wasn't moved to repentance. It illustrates the fact that it's a difficult thing to move men and women to repent. I think the most difficult thing that we attempt to get people to do is to get them to repent. It's not so difficult to convince people that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that the Bible is of divine origin. And when people believe, it isn't difficult to get them to be baptized. But it is difficult to get people to repent, to turn from their sins. In this connection, I think of our master's work in Bethsaida and Chorazin. It is said in the 11th chapter of Matthew that then began he to obey the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in you, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. And thou, Capernaum, shalt thou be exalted unto heaven, thou shalt be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would remain until this day. You think about our Lord's great preaching. He spake as man never spake. Think about his sinless life. Think about the spell and influence of his presence. And then think about his wonderful miracles. And yet these people were not moved by our Lord to repent. If our Lord with all of his resources failed to move men to repentance, we need not be surprised if we fail now. But our, failure, our Lord's failure to move these people of the Galilean Lake to repentance illustrates the difficulty of getting some people to repent. And so we are not greatly surprised after all that one of these robbers remained impenitent. But the one on the other hand uh, became penitent. He changed the tone of his talk. We read, for example, that these two robbers or malefactors both reproached our Lord Jesus Christ. But one of them changed the tone of his talk. I don't know why he did that. It may have been that he remembered wholesome teaching and better days. Our Lord's mother was standing by the cross. This man's mother may have been standing by, and her presence may have reminded him of better things and better uh, teaching. Whether that's true or not, we know that this man was standing in the presence of eternity. This man was in the act of dying, and he knew it. This man knew that it wouldn't be long until he'd be in the great hereafter, and that was enough to move him to change the attitude of his heart and the tone of his talk. And he reproved his fellow malefactor. He said, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? This man, he said, hath done nothing amiss. But we indeed, he said, suffer justly. This man was evidently a Jew. This man was not a Sadducee because he believed in the future life. He believed in the hereafter. This man believed in God. He wasn't an atheist. Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And when this man appealed unto Jesus, he said, Lord Jesus, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. I think that this is one of the most remarkable examples of faith in all the Bible. There were persons who did not believe in Jesus when he's performing his wonderful miracles. There were people who did not believe in him when he was raising the dead, as for example at Bethany when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And here's a man that believes on Christ when Christ himself is in the act of dying. 
Lord Jesus, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And Jesus said to this man on the cross, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. Now that was good news, wasn't it? There were two elements of good news in that statement. Sometimes victims on the cross would linger for days, four or five days, sometimes eight or ten days. They would suffer indescribable agony. It said that they would, of course, lose much blood. They would be tortured with thirst. They would be burned with fevers. And sometimes they'd become demented and die in the most terrible paroxysms of pain. And yet our Lord said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That meant that by sunset his physical suffering would be ended. That was good news, wasn't it? He was telling him that your suffering will not be extended over several days, but by sunset. I have seen men in such agony that they prayed for death. I saw men penned beneath a locomotive engine, beneath a boiler, between Atlanta and East Point. The poor man was being scalded to death by steam. He begged those standing by to knock him in the head or otherwise take his life, get him out of his agony. And those dying on the cross sometimes pleaded with those standing by to do something to hasten death. And we must surprise, therefore, that our Lord tells this man, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Oh, it was good news to learn that it wouldn't be a long, drawn-out period of suffering with him. And in the second place, it was good news because he said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, paradise does not always mean heaven. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't here. Our Lord didn't go to heaven when he died. We know that he didn't. Peter tells us in the second chapter of Acts where Jesus went when he died. You will recall that in his great sermon on Pentecost, Peter quoted from David, Thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Although David was speaking in the first person, Peter said David wasn't talking about himself. He said David's tomb's with us. David's body saw corruption. David's not ascended into the heavens. He's still in Hades. But he said he was talking about Christ, whose soul was not left in Hades, whose body didn't see corruption. That means then that our Lord's soul went to Hades when he died. Hades is the realm of the dead, the intermediate state the place where persons go on dying and in which they abide until the resurrection. There were two sections in Hades, one known among the Greeks as Paradise, the other known as Tartarus. Among the Jews, instead of using the word Paradise, they talked about Abraham's bosom. You remember that when Lazarus died, he was carried away to Abraham's bosom. But the rich man in Hades lifted up his eyes. He was in a place of torment. He was in Tartarus. The word found in his verb form over in Second Peter. God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, down to Tartarus. And so when Jesus said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise, it was good news in two senses, wasn't it? First, your physical agony will not be long drawn out. Second, you'll be with me in the land of the blessed, in the realm of the saved. You'll be with me in paradise. But we're primarily interested in the first central cross, first in importance. That cross represents death for sin. The impenitent robber's cross, death in sin. The penitent robber's cross, death to sin. Paul talks about Christians having died to sin in the sixth chapter of the Roman letter. 
in the sense they quit sin, death in sin, the impenitent, death to sin, the penitent robber, and the central cross bearing Jesus, representing death for sin. Do we not read in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures? Now the modernists ridicule the idea of the atoning merits of Jesus' blood. But the inspired penman of the Bible knew better than that. And they speak of the blood of Jesus Christ as being the atoning price for our redemption. Our Lord said, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Yes, his blood, his life, the ransom price. And our Lord was instituting the Lord's Supper when he came to the fruit of the vine. He said, This is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. As our Lord taught that his blood was being shed for the remission of sins. And when John was writing the last book of the New Testament, in the first chapter of the Revelation, he said by way of ascribing honor and glory unto Christ, he said unto him that loved us and loosed us from our sins with his own blood. Yes, the central cross is the one that occupies and properly so our attention. We like to think about Jesus Christ as paying the price of our redemption. We like to remember what Paul said in the Galatian letter. He said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the beginning of the first century, the cross was the symbol of shame and reproach. But by the time Paul had, was writing the Galatian letter, something had happened that had changed the whole meaning and symbolism of the cross for many people. Instead of being the symbol of reproach, it had become the ensign of salvation and hope for many persons. What was it that changed the meaning of the cross for persons like Paul? Oh, it was the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Yes, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. Let's in imagination go back to Calvary and let's study again our Lord's actions and words while he was on the cross. There are seven words that are recorded from the lips of our Lord as being pronounced while he was on the cross. He was nailed on the cross about nine o'clock our time and expired about three in the afternoon. Lived for six mortal hours. And he spoke three statements during the first three hours. The first statement was not in behalf of himself. It was not in behalf of his relatives. Not in behalf of his friends. But rather in behalf of his enemies. He said, Father... Forgive them, for they know not what to do. The word said there is in the imperfect tense. In the Greek language, the imperfect tense is the tense of repeated action in past time. It might be translated, he kept on saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. The idea seems to be that each time they heaped upon him some additional agony, our shame and reproach that our Lord repeated these words. Father, forgive them. They know not what to do. He kept on saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what to do. How could anyone in contemplation of these words refuse or fail to forgive his brother who sins against him and penitently asks ask for forgiveness? And notice that our Lord urges a mitigating circumstance. It's difficult to see a mitigating circumstance in the case of an enemy, isn't it? But our Lord sees a mitigating circumstance in the case of those who had spat upon him, had butted him with their hands, had gambled for his garments, had lied about him, and had driven the nails in his hands. 
Oh, I said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. Do we not read that Pilate knew that for envy the Jews had delivered him up? Yes, we read that. But they didn't know concerning Christ what we know. They didn't know that Jesus Christ was and is the Son of the living God in the sense that he's deity. They didn't know that the blood they were shedding was the only blood that could atone for their sins and make it such that God could forgive them and remember them no more. They didn't know that. In fact, in the second chapter and eighth verse of 1 Corinthians, Paul said if they'd known that, they wouldn't have put him to death. Peter said in the book of Acts, he said, I know, brethren, that through ignorance you did it. They didn't have complete knowledge. They crucified him through ignorance and prejudice. He kept on saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. Yes, I repeat it. How could anyone refuse to forgive his brother when he's contemplating what Christ said on the cross? There may be some question as the order of the next statement, but it's very likely that the next statement had reference to our Lord's mother. Mary was standing by. That was like her, wasn't it? Wasn't it like a mother to do that? And that old Simeon told Mary that a sword would pierce her soul. Of course, that's a figurative expression. A literal sword couldn't pierce an immaterial soul. But the word sword is used in a figurative sense. He's talking about some penetrating, cutting, painful experience or bereavement that would come into the life of Mary. And he said, a sword shall pierce thy soul. Can you doubt that the sword was sheathed in the soul of Mary as she stood by on Calvary? and saw her son crucified and raised up on the cross. There wasn't anything she could do about it. She was denied the privilege of administering those niceties that a mother's love would have suggested. And our master is aware of the situation, of course. And he said, Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. And John took Mary from the cross. That hour he took her to his own home. The scene was a harrowing scene for Mary, wasn't it? And John took her to his own home. If we didn't know anything else about John other than that, he'd be forever endeared to us, wouldn't he? The fact that our Lord on the day of the cross asked John to take care of his mother is a great compliment to John. Our, John, our Lord preferred that his mother be in the home of John rather than in the home of her own children. John would understand and John would love. And from that hour, he took her into his own home. And then the third statement may be the one, seemingly, the penitent robber. Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. That's rather worthy of observation that even after his death and resurrection, his disciples didn't seem to have a very clear idea about the kingdom. They asked him, Lord, will thou this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? But at any rate, this man on the cross understands that Jesus is going to establish a kingdom. Somehow he'd heard about Jesus' teaching, maybe it hurt him. Remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. The day shall thou be with me, he said in paradise. I've already commented on that. And then we read that the sixth hour came, about twelve o'clock our time, and a vast darkness spread over all the land. That was an awe-inspiring thing, wasn't it? The sun refused to shine upon this revolting scene. How awe-inspiring it must have been. At high noon, the sun is veiled in darkness. 
darkness is spread over all the land. Our Lord suffers in silence, it seemingly almost to the end of the three hours. And then he speaks the fourth word from the cross, and in some respects the saddest statement from the lips of our Lord. Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani. Which by interpretation means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Our Lord was not unaccustomed to being forsaken. Bethlehem, the town of his birth, had no room for him. Nazareth, the town of his rearing, expelled him. Capernaum, the town of his adoption, rejected him. And Jerusalem, the city of the great king, had crucified him. And now when the night is darkest and the water's deepest, the burden the heaviest, God Almighty withdraws from him, allows him to tread the wine press alone, as the old prophet said. What does it mean? Oh, it means that Christ is dying as the sinner would have died in his sins. It means that Christ is tasting death for every man. It means that the sins of the whole race are upon him. And he is dying as the sinner would have had to die in his sins had he not died for the sinner. It's no wonder that our Lord was recoiling from Calvary in the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, it wasn't the physical suffering. Our Lord refused a stupefying draft when the women offered it to him. It was the spiritual anguish. That was the thing that was weighing heavily on our Lord. And that's the thing that he feels when he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was the spiritual anguish of Calvary. And we'll never know how great it was. The burden he bore. And then again our Lord speaks. He said, I thirst. Our Lord is thirsting physically and literally. That he may open, from us, open for us a fountain from which we can drink spiritually and never thirst. It's not surprising that our Lord cries out that he thirsts. Had he not been scourged? A Roman scourging was a brutal experience. Sometimes the poor victims came forth from the scourging with their bowels and their teeth knocked out and sometimes they died beneath the brutality of the lash. When our Lord was scourged, he'd lost blood in the scourging. He'd lost blood on the cross. He'd spent a restless, sleepless, drinkless night. No wonder that we read, I thirst. Yes, he was tortured with thirst that we might be enabled to satisfy our spiritual thirst in the fountain he was opening for us. And then again our Lord speaks, it's the cry of victory. He said it's finished. Isn't it a marvelous thing for a person to finish his work as he finishes his life? So many people have left unfinished tasks. Many an author has left an unfinished book. Many a preacher an unfinished sermon. Many a writer an unfinished article. I remember Brother Strickler was writing an article in the advocate office one day. His daughter came for him, take him home. He's in advanced years in his 80s. He remarked to me, he said, I began an article this afternoon. I don't know whether I'll ever finish it or not. Well, the old brother never finished that article. He left an unfinished article. So many people leave unfinished tasks. But our Lord finished his work as he finished his life. He said, it's finished. As a worker, his task has been accomplished. Everything that God intended for him to do up to that time had been done. It is said that our Lord, during his public ministry, fulfilled 332 predictions of the Old Testament. It is said that during the last 24 hours of his life, he fulfilled more than 24 predictions. Yes, he said it's finished. Everything the prophet said that he would do up to the time. Everything that God wanted him to do up to that time had been done. As a worker, 
his task is complete. As a sufferer, his agony is ended. It's finished. And then he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirits. And the Son of God dies. In imagination you could see his chin sank upon a bosom that heaves no longer with life or agony. His hands are now insensible to the presence of the nails. His eyes are closed to the hatred of the multitude. Our Lord is dead. And when our Lord dies, the foundations of Jerusalem are shaken. The tombs of the sainted dead are broken open. And yonder in the temple, the veil is rent from the top to the bottom. Prodigies such as the world had not experienced before took place. It's little wonder that the old centurion supervising the crucifixion said, Truly this man's the Son of God. He was accustomed to supervising crucifixions, no doubt, but he'd never seen anything like that. He'd never seen anybody else die like Jesus died. Old Rousseau said, if Socrates died like a man, Jesus died like a God. And he did. Can you wonder that Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross? Yes, that central cross, death for sin, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Not many of the sins of the Jews of the first century or the Gentiles of the first century. He died for the sins of people in every century. Your sins and mine had as much to do in sending him to the cross as the sins of anybody else so far as the Bible indicates. By the grace of God he tasted death for every man. My sinner friend, my prodigal brother, can you contemplate the death of Christ on the cross? Can you contemplate his suffering? Can you contemplate his conduct? Can you contemplate his dying and still turn a deaf ear to his invitation? Does it mean nothing to you that Christ died for you? Can you brush it aside in indifference and flippantly? The most important thing in the world is right relationship toward Christ and his death. Better would it be for you never to have been born than to live and die without having accepted Jesus Christ. What are you going to do about it tonight? You're not going to be the same tonight when you leave that you were when you came. If you accept Christ, you'll be made better. If you fail to accept him, you'll be made worse. The initiative is with you. The responsibility is yours. God and Christ have done everything they can do to save you without violating your free moral agency. The banquet table of God's grace is spread. The invitation is all things are now ready. Come. The initiative is yours. Will you come now while we stand and sing? Oh, Lord, God bless the worthy boy. The land was like the eyes against the Lord.